Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I, I've been wanting to do this podcast for a long time because, look, I, I have I have no illusions that I know that uh, people in the Democratic Party are not going to be listening to people like me or Mona Charon or even Tim Miller or JVL when we tell them, look, you have one job. Just don't fuck this up, because if you do fuck this up, you're going to be getting a second term of Donald Trump. And I understand. Look, I understand the people who say, look, why should we listen to you since um, your own party didn't listen to you? Right. I mean, uh, we, we, we got this. We, we we've handled this. Um, but I'm hoping that you will listen to people from your own tribe uh, who have uh, been in Democratic Party circles for decades, uh, whose progressive credentials are solid. And I can't think of anyone better than today's guest, Rui Tushera, political scientist uh, and author. His books include The Optimistic Leftist, Why the 21st Century Will Be Better Than You Think. And uh, the 2002 book, The Emerging Democratic Majority. And uh, Rui is the co editor of the Substack newsletter, The Liberal Patriot, and a fellow at the Center for American Progress. Now, first of all, um, thanks for joining me, Rui. Delighted to be here, Charlie. So I'm a, I'm a faithful uh, listener to your podcast and the stuff you write. So I'm, I'm really happy to do this. Okay. Well, I'm really glad to hear that because. I have a confession to make that that often I will read your newsletter and I am highly tempted to say, you know, I should just turn over my newsletter to Rui. I should just like cut and paste everything from the liberal patriot telling Democrats what you're doing wrong, how you need to fix it and just take it. So <laughs> but that seems unfair. And that seems well, kind of, achievable. you know, I mean, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So you know, I'm happy to, you know, the more it gets around, the better, though. I like to think we're sort of, working different parts of the territory. So, yeah. there's, uh, you know, different voices uh, reach different people. So, Well, I'm not talking about imitation. I'm talking about flat out theft. <laughs> <laughs> Just cutting and paying. So your book, um, The Emerging Democratic Majority, 2002, what went wrong? What is going wrong right now? There was so much optimism uh, a year ago. Democrats thought they had the wind at their back. They were going to be transformative, right? Mm -hmm. Big change, FDR, LBJ. And here we are, and I understand, well, I'm going to get a lot of emails saying, everything is fine. Joe Biden's doing a great job. But uh, the polls would suggest that uh, things are not going well. Let, let's, let's start right there. Do Democrats understand that they are in for a world of pain if they don't, if they don't change direction? Do they get it yet? Well, I think they understand that uh, the way things are today, things look bad, and they have the potential for being in a world of pain. Um, but I, I think the dominant tendency is not to interpret that as meaning there has to be a very substantial change, of course. I think the, the whistling past the graveyard interpretation is, well, you know, the COVID will recede a bit and the economy should improve a bit. Inflation's more transitory than not. We're going to pass some cool legislation that the honest workers and peasants of America like, uh, and somehow it'll all get better in the end. And there's no need to, to do anything particularly different in terms of their approach, just kind of clean it up a little bit. I mean, I think that's essentially what Biden has been saying. And what most, you know, Schumer and people in the leadership of the party. But, you know, I personally think that's inadequate, <laughs> to say the least. But <clears throat> I think the dominant tendency is still not to contemplate a very substantial change, of course. So you, um, you, you wrote your, your <laughs> Substack newsletter last week, uh, how not to build a coalition. And you argued that the left's theory of the case is falling apart. Uh, and and you, you address several different elements. You know, they're, the the stories they tell themselves about turnout, about uh, mm -hmm. what what people of color want to hear from them, uh, whether cultural leftism is 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 a winner for them, um, and how to address the the issue of uh, democracy, as well as you know telling themselves that it's a transformative change. So let, let's can we just kind of walk through, you know, what the progressive theory of the case is and why you're not buying it. Let's let's start with turnout. What, okay. what are Democrats telling themselves about turnout that you disagree with? Well, it's not just what they've been telling themselves now about turnout. It's what they've been telling themselves about turnout forever. The theory is always 
Um, the reason why Democrats don't win more often than they do, and the key to winning whatever election is upcoming, is you know getting very high turnout because we know that the constituencies that have lower turnout tend to favor Democrats. So if we get higher turnout, that means we'll win, right? But mm -hmm. the problem with that is that the elections that have the highest turnout tend to be elections that are relatively polarized, that uh, you know, sort of voters kind of are propelled into action by the perceived stakes. And the problem with the idea that if there's high turnout, uh, you know, will win is that the implicit assumption is always that high turnout means our people <laughs> will turn out at, at a high level and the other people will stay home. Well, that's not the way it works. A mountain of electoral and political science evidence suggests that in a high turnout election, everybody's turnout goes up. And that means the people you don't like show up as well, uh, who don't like your side. And that's in, precisely in, in, what happened in 20. 2020, where the Democrats didn't win because of high turnout, even though it's very high turnout election, um, they actually won because of shifts within the voter population. If anything, turnout on net probably benefited the Republicans a little bit more than the Democrats in 2020 and 2021. We also saw some high turnout elections that essentially benefited Republicans more than Democrats. So it's a very lazy way of thinking to think that, well, if you know, we could just get the masses of, of voters out there. It's automatically going to benefit us. Not so. All right. People of color, this belief that the growth of the non-white population, the demographics will weld them to the Democratic Party. And this was widely believed over the last four or five years. I think maybe on both sides of the aisle that, mm -hmm. that the changing demographics meant, you know, more people of color meant uh, a permanent majority for the Democrats. What's the reality turning out to be? Well, some of this uh, uh, kind of analysis or take goes back to something John Judas and I wrote in 2002 in the Emerging Democratic Majority when we did talk about how the rise, you know, increasing proportion of non-whites in the population provided real opportunity for the Democrats to consolidate a majority, among other factors we, we talked about, because, you know, they tended to favor Democrats and the uh, White constituencies were declining that did in favor Democrats on net, on average, all else equal, that should benefit the Democrats. The problem is that that's not automatic. It means you still have to appeal to, uh, you know, those various constituencies within the non-white population in a way that makes them want to continue to support you. It means you can't lose too much support uh, from the white working class on the other end because they're still a huge group. Um, and what we saw, interestingly enough, I think in 2020, was sort of the apotheosis of what I think of as a bowdlerization of our thesis from 2002, which is now we're thinking of all non-whites as people of color who uh, share all these common interests because they're oppressed by a system of white supremacy and structural racism. And the bigger a deal we make out of this, the more it will weld these people of color together Right. a massive, unshakable coalition against the Republicans. And that did not turn out to be true. Actually, uh, Biden did worse than Clinton did among non-whites, particularly they, among they, Hispanics, particularly among Hispanic working class voters. And in fact, uh, it did not turn out to be the case that sort of doubling and redoubling your effort to betray uh, the country as a cesspool of racism that oppresses people of color actually moved uh, these people in your direction, these voters so, in your direction. So the Democrats lost seven margin points from 2016 among black voters, and they lost 16 points from their 2016 margin among Hispanics. Why okay. is this happening? You know, I, I don't know that anybody saw that coming. So, you know, the Democrats have a real problem with Hispanic voters. I think you've written it's much bigger, mm -hmm. it's much worse than they think it is. What's happening? Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I think what's happening is, uh, a couple of things really hit the Democrats in 2020 that I think were underlying problems. Uh, one was that uh, Democrats became associated with sort of a, a lack of urgency about reopening the economy. Uh, there was some residual goodwill among Hispanics toward the Trump economy, which actually worked pretty well for them. Hmm. This is a very hardworking, upwardly mobile constituency, hmm. which prizes the ability to get ahead. And they thought, you know, Trump wasn't that terrible in that in that respect. Um, and then they had doubts about the Democrats as things began to unfold during the pandemic about their commitment to get everybody back to work. And Trump and the Republicans really played on that. The second thing, though, 
uh, that's connected to this really is, you know, not only are they a hardworking, upwardly mobile constituency, they're also patriotic, they're also relatively culturally conservative. They're not really, you know, moved necessarily by the idea that America is a white supremacist cesspool, which, you know, they had the misfortune to, to, to live in this country. That's not how they look at it at all. Uh, they look at it as America in some ways as, as a land of opportunity. And, you know, that didn't really move them in the Democrats' direction to take that tack. And then, of course, we had weird slogans coming down the pike that were associated with the Democrats, like defund the police, which is, you know, couldn't be more toxic with most Hispanic working class voters and working class voters in general who live, tend to live in communities where crime is an actual problem. And the idea that somehow you're going to solve America's public safety problems by defunding the police is just, you know, doesn't pass the laugh test. So, 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 so yeah, I think so, the Democrats have become associated with a variety of weird cultural things like Latin X, like defund the police, like uh, personal pronouns, you name it, that I think for, uh, you know, Hispanic working class voters in particular are uh, very off-putting. So that segued into your your next point is this the story they tell themselves that cultural leftism is a winner. And as you point out, so they've managed to associate Democrats with views on crime, immigration, policing, and other issues that are way far off from the views of, of median voters. Biden tried to distance himself from that, right? I mean, he, he disassociated himself from the defund police, but it didn't seem to, it it, it doesn't seem to be penetrating. No, be, I so mean, many, so many voices it, yeah. associated with the Democratic Party that are saying those yeah. things and were saying those things. And the party has shown very little interest. And in, even when a politician like Biden says, I'm not for to fund the police, he's very reluctant to draw lines within the party about that and say, not only do I not think that to fund the police is a good idea, I think anybody advocating it is, does really not represent the Democratic Party. This is just wrong. So-and-so said X. I think so-and-so is very wrong. So there's, I mean, you wrote about this, Charlie, yeah. yourself, when you said okay. that, uh, you know, Biden needs to have a series of sister soldier type moments mm -hmm. to draw those lines and make it clear to, you know, the average voter that, in fact, that's not where the Democrats are coming from. And I think there's been a real reluctance to do this on the cultural leftism front because it is so influential within Democratic activist circles, within coastal elites, within nonprofit organizations, advocacy organizations, foundations, the media, the sort of so-called mainstream media. I mean, there is, you know, for want of a better word, a serious sort of woke hegemony in a lot of these areas that I think is very tied to the Democratic Party. And I think Democratic politicians have been very, very leery of trying to cross because of you know, the firestorm that they, they fear it would produce if they did so. Also, I mean, my view is always that they're not, they're not, they're not paying attention to the fact that cultural leftism, as I said in my article, is not a winner. And the main reason it's not a winner is because it's not what people think. It's not what people believe, particularly working class people. Uh, it's anathema to them. They, they should keep that in mind because, you know, when a Hispanic or black activist or a youth activist says to them, well, you know, we have to take these positions because, you know, the people want it or it's, you know, it's an emergency. Believe me, everyone will support you. That's just wrong. They will not support you. They will, in fact, it's, it's a liability for you in electoral political terms. And I think that sometimes people at the, even people at the head of the party who should know better are, are heavily influenced by that. And I don't think they should be. I think they should realize that on net, this is a liability for them. And in fact, as I argued in another Substack, it puts a ceiling on their support. Uh, so and it gives the lie to the whole idea that they're somehow gonna weld all these different constituencies together into a rising American electorate to demands this kind of, Politics. I think that's completely incorrect. So the the left will usually argue that you know these problems around crime and policing are exaggerated by Fox News and therefore can be ignored. That that they see them through the fear filter. You call that the Fox News fallacy, which adds to this problem. So talk to me about what you mean by the Fox News fallacy on the left. I came up with the idea or the phrase about the Fox News fallacy because of my experience writing some of these articles where I targeted what I felt were uh, 
out of the mainstream, you know, sort of counterproductive positions by the Democrats on things like immigration and crime, schooling and what have you. And frequently the, re the reply I get from some people on the left would be, oh, come on, you can't say that. That's a Fox News talking point. Right. You're just like playing into the, you know, the hint, the, the pause of the right when you do this. And they would say, and besides, you know, I mean, immigration, it's, you know, they sure there was a surge at the border, kind of, but it's not a crisis. And just because of the weather and the time of year it is. And, you know, the crime thing, it's not as bad as the 1990s. And, you know, some crimes haven't really gone up. It was sort of this, this willful intent to disregard a very significant problem that was occurring at the time. It was obvious to anyone who had eyes. So I thought that what, and, and obviously it's not a very um, effective reply if people have a concern about public safety to say, you know, Fox News, that's what Fox News says. It, to, to, the, to the average voter, simply pointing out that conservatives say something does not automatically make it untrue. Um, but that is the illusion I think a lot of Democrats uh, suffer under, and I think it prevents them from having effective replies and effective policies to deal with things like crime, immigration, schooling, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I think that's that's a real problem. I think it blinds them to what they need to do. It's comforting to them to think, oh, yeah, these are just Fox News talking points, but <laughs> hey, this is the real world. If you don't reply to concerns that voters actually have, then they're going to think you're not very serious and they will look for alternatives. Okay, so while they're not addressing issues like, for example, crime and, and, and the border, um, they have been focusing really extensively on the current threat to democracy, arguing that the current threat to democracy is so great that people just have to vote uh, Democratic. You make the very provocative argument uh, that January 6th is not working as a sales pitch for rejecting Republicans, not working with voters, efforts to cast the Republicans as hostile democracy is just not landing. Okay, now, obviously, I think it ought to be landing. I think it's incredibly important, but the polls would suggest that you're right. So talk to me about what the Democrats are doing with democracy and, and why that's not moving the electorate in their direction. Yeah, well, I think that um, Democrats really do have a hard time sort of thinking in terms of average voters as opposed to what they themselves think. Mm. Uh, again, this is sort mm. of the liberal college graduate mm. bubble yeah. a lot of the Democratic Party is in. And for those people, January 6th was this cut point, right? This is like unbelievable what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, it just shows that we're, you know, incipient fascism is here in the United States. Uh, we must double down and triple down, you know, no pass our own. Uh, we've got to actually uh, sort of mobilize the, the masses out there an indignation about this abrogation of democracy and this threat of authoritarianism. And, you know, there's a not unreasonable case. <laughs> it was a very bad thing, whether it was an insurrection, we could argue about. But, um, you know, clearly it was a very bad thing. I think most, most voters thought it was a very bad thing. The problem is that over time, they stopped thinking about it nearly as much as mm -hmm. uh, Democratic elites do a Democratic activists. And they're much more concerned with mundane things like what the hell's happening with COVID? What's happening with the economy? What's happening in my community? What's happening with healthcare? They have very specific concerns they want the government to address. And more than anything else, and we'll probably get to this, they wanted to return to normality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, life as they conceive it was before COVID. And going on and on and on about the incipient threat of fascism isn't really reaching them. And I think... Related to that, uh, we have, you know, this sort of inexplicable drive of the Democrats to try to pass a big voting rights bill, which was doomed to begin with. And the sort of rhetoric around that bill uh, and the extensions and safeguards for voting rights that it, it would promulgate was essentially identical to the level of rhetoric around the January 6th riots. It was like, this is a crisis of democracy. If we don't pass it, we're all in the soup. You know, the, the, the authoritarians will take over. And on, you know, so over all of that, they put this kind of racial overlay that, uh, you know, not passing the voting rights bill amounts to a new Jim Crow, which actually, if you look at the things that have been done in various states in terms of voting procedures where they tighten them up, it doesn't really amount to Jim Crow at all. I mean, it's undesirable. Uh, it's clearly not motivated by pristine uh, concerns on the part of the Republicans. They actually do think this would go some ways toward uh, reducing Democratic turnout, but uh, it's not Jim Crow. And the good news for the Democrats, and this has been shown over and over again, and 
in a quantitative studies is this stuff doesn't really do anything. I mean, or very little. At the margin, these voting procedure laws don't wind up making that much difference in either overall turnout levels or outcomes. So, and yet they um, spent the enormous themselves. Yeah. This is going to be effective, and Democrats are getting hysterical uh, about something that really wouldn't have that big an effect. And in the in the process, and this is what really ticks me off about the whole thing, Charlie. The thing that, if you really believe there's a crisis of the democracy in this country, it comes from the kind of stuff Trump was trying to do, right? With overturning the actual results of right. actual how the votes are counted, how they're certified. Mm -hmm. The voting rights bills did not address that in a very frontal way. And that's the key thing. And that's probably, that's what people would support. And you could even get some bipartisan support for it. So why the, you know, the kamikaze charge to try to get the voting rights bills passed when they could have, uh, you know, taken a few of counted? I, I, See, I have to admit that I, I have the same take on this, and I'm, I'm puzzled by the, you know, their decision to spend enormous political capital on these bills that did not address the actual coup, and and that they mm -hmm. they wanted to do something, so they they had the crash and burn with Build Back Better, and they immediately pivoted to this other piece of legislation that was also doomed to fail. I don't quite understand what's driving the strategy here, even just on a tactical level. Yeah, no, it is a bit of a mystery to me, too. I mean, it's a head scratcher, particularly when you put it that way, you know, sort of having a big failure and then, well, let's, okay, we had a big failure, something that might have worked out. Let's do something, well, it's almost, we know it's not going to work out. <laughs> you know, uh, so it doesn't make any sense from that perspective. I do think a, a good chunk of this has to do with the desire of the Biden administration to keep peace in the Valley and to defer to uh, the left of the Democratic Party uh, in terms of its priorities and send signals that they're on their side. And somehow this, you know, they're, they're sort of scared that if they don't do it, they'll make a lot of trouble. They'll, um, you know, people won't turn out in the next election. And I just disagree with that. I think, again, because my theory is that voters have much more mundane concerns than those promulgated by the activists who report to speak in their name. Um, in fact, it's not clear that if you tick some of these progressives off that you're going to get low turnout. I don't think that follows at all. In fact, I think the best thing that for the Democrats would be to get the country back to normal and not, you know, it's not well, worry so much about passing big bills that, you know, sort of crash and burn. Or let's talk about that, because, of course, Democrats have uh, talked themselves into thinking that they needed to have a transformative agenda. They needed to pass on. And, and of course, they've told themselves that the elements of these bills are, you know, standalone, very, very popular, and that the country wants this kind of transformative legislation. You're saying, no, that's not what the country wants, or they may say they want some of it, but they want Norm, what does normal look like? And, and how are voters reacting to these attempts to have transformative legislation? Well, I wrote after Biden got elected and, uh, you know, they managed to take the Senate with the Georgia runoffs. Uh, I cautioned that while Democrats might feel that they have, uh, you know, sort of run some running room to pass some interesting legislation, in reality, the Democrats were elected to do two things. One is to contain the COVID pandemic, and the other was to get the economy humming again, uh, back to some semblance of normality. People are really tired. They're exhausted with both COVID and all the restrictions. They're, you know, sensitive to what's happening with the economy. Uh, and, you know, as it turned out, um, the Democrats, even though they've gotten a lot of good economic indicators, we do have these supply and inflation problems, which doesn't strike people as particularly normal in the COVID thing. Um, you know, to some extent, some things were out of Biden's control, some things weren't, but we're clearly not back to normal. So that is the thing that people wanted the most, and that was the highest priority, and it didn't happen nearly as much as it needed to. Instead, Democrats decided that, yeah, okay, we want to get things back to normal too. Yeah, we want to do that stuff. But now it's, a, it's transformation time. I mean, it's time to you know, do all the things that we had in mind that we haven't been able to do for years. So you know, initially, wasn't it Sanders who came up with like a $6 trillion uh, Build Back Better package? And that was uh, obviously, you know, kind of completely crazy. So they trimmed it to a mere three and a half trillion. And in the process, this, you know, we saw this endless debate unfold about how much it would cost, which programs would be in, which programs would be out. 
to the typical, the median American voters sitting there trying, you know, thinking, like, hey, what's going on? I mean, when are things going to get back to normal? I mean, this is a crazy kind of dialogue to be immersed in. I mean, where nobody knew was in those bills after all. Nobody knew, no. right? I mean, the American Rescue Plan was passed. People kind of got that. I mean, that was, that was directed at the actual existing problem of getting the economy going and providing uh, stuff that would help bring the COVID pandemic under control. But after that, everybody completely lost the plot. They had no idea what was going on. I would ask people, do you know what's in the building? I would ask people who were like very educated and you know reasonably politically aware. They had no, no idea. And then the, the denouement, the tragic denouement of all this, that the thing that really screwed the, the Dems and brought this sort of transformation uh, you know, sort of fallacy into, into focus was when the infrastructure bill was passed through the Senate and the House Progressive Caucus held it hostage to getting an agreement on the Build Back Better bill that they felt was, was adequate, which again was completely crazy. I mean, people didn't get it. It prevented the Democrats from being able to focus on something people could understand and made people focus on something they can't understand. And all the while, of course, anyone who knew anything about the politics of the actual situation in the House and the Senate knew that it was going to be heavily trimmed back anyway, right? They weren't going to get three and a half trillion dollars worth of tax with a zillion programs. Um, you know, we could go into details of it, but the details are too depressing to, to do that. Um, and in the end, it got held up and held up and held up and held up. And finally, the progressive caucus caved a bit and they were able to pass the infrastructure bill. And of course, after that, the, the obvious problems with, with trying to elaborate the spill and get it through uh, rose to the fore again, and it didn't. Okay, work. so I, I'm, I'm sitting in my basement in Mequon, Wisconsin, thinking at the time that this was political malpractice. And yet you have all these smart people like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden who went along with this strategy. And I'm thinking, what am I missing here? Why would you not take the win? You're on the five inch line. And this was going to always end badly in this particular way. It was pretty obvious. And now we have the situation where they pass this really popular, really consequential piece of legislation that they ought to be celebrating and selling and everybody feels bad about it. So in, in many ways, it feels like they played even their winning hand as badly as possible. And I don't understand what they were thinking. Yes. So I go back to something uh, I mentioned a few times, which is that I think that the leadership of the party overestimates the strength of the yeah. left in the party. They're too deferential to it. They're yeah, afraid to they cross it. To some extent, they, you know, Biden himself probably sold them a bit of a bill of goods about, you know, the new FDR. But I think that wouldn't have lasted as long as it did if it wasn't for. Yeah sort of walking in fear. About okay, but I, I, I thought that Biden got that. I mean, he ran to the center. He beat Bernie Sanders. He beat Elizabeth Warren. He was the guy who was going to cut the deals across the aisle. So what what is the deal with Biden? What is your take on Joe Biden? Well, I think Biden, um, well, I like the guy. I think he's always been a creature of what he perceives to be the center of gravity of the party. And... In the primary, it was pretty easy to see that where he was coming from was more the center of gravity of the party than the people on the left. But once he, you know, basically secured the nomination, his view quickly evolved to, I've got to make everybody happy here. So he tried to incorporate all the Sanders Eastas and Warren Eastas in, in the, the planning process for the campaign and the policy ideas. Uh, and once he was in office, he felt he needed to uh, produce for them as well. And I think that thinking continued throughout the first year of the Biden administration, where we've got to be very careful not to cross the progressive caucus and the progressives in Congress to the point where, yeah. as famously, he went down and whipped against his own bill in the process of the infrastructure bill debacle. So all very strange, but I do think the origins of it, the, the sort of underlying problem is the perceived you know, and perhaps incorrectly perceived influence of the progressive 
part of the Democratic Party yeah. on political strategy when so, it really shouldn't have that much influence because it doesn't make any sense. So I, I want to get to what the, what they should be doing, but I want to get your sense of of what where you think the country is. You know, you wrote a book about the emerging Democratic majority. Is this country center right still? Is it center left? Is it centrist? Are are those the wrong political categories? What is your take about what does the country want? What does a workable governing majority look like these days? Mm -hmm. Well, um, John uh, Judas and I, when we wrote the Emerging Democratic Majority back in, in 2002, we did attach a name to what we felt was a plausible governing strategy, which was progressive centrism. We felt that mm. uh, if you cleave to the center of American public opinion and the views of these emerging constituencies, you could elaborate a you know, sort of increasing role for government in terms of making lives better for people, uh, a relatively tolerant cultural climate, a variety of other things that would help America develop in a way that was uh, more equal, uh, better for, for most people. Um, but you didn't want to get too far over your skis because that's not where the average voter is coming from, uh, even the average voter from some of these emerging constituencies. So we were very careful to uh, say that and to emphasize it. And I think what's happened is that the country, in fact, has moved to the left in some important ways. The problem is that the Democratic Party and the image it presents to average voters has moved much farther to the left. So I think the problem isn't that, you know, the Democrats don't realize we're a center-right country. They don't realize we're a center-left country, but a moderate center-left country. That, uh, you know, the kinds of things that transformational politics that are elaborated and promulgated by the progressive wing of the Democratic Party do not represent where people are. So, um, you, that, but there yeah. is a center mm -hmm. that is actually very congenial to... Uh, traditional Democratic Party values. And I mean, in many ways, Obama got a lot of this stuff right. And for some reason, they've forgotten a lot of this stuff. So you've written a lot about the working class voters. And and I, I think one of the stories, obviously, the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years has been that one of the most reliable constituencies for the Democratic Party, the working class, felt that it was abandoned by the Democrats and have drifted over to the Republicans. And as you've written, the Republicans have a growing problem. Uh, I, the the de Democrats are adding suburban college-educated voters, mm -hmm. but it's not clear they're adding them at the speed or the volume to replace the working-class voters they're losing. Is that is that a fair summary of? That's a very mean? fair summary. Okay. So what what's happening and what do Democrats need to do? Um, from the point of view of working class voters, they look at the debate that's going on right now, and I think they see an elite Democratic Party that has a, that abandoned them, that is not speaking to them, that looks mm -hmm. down on them, and they felt this way for a very long time. How do you turn that around? Good question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... A as, as this situation has evolved over, over time in the 21st century, I think Democrats did until relatively recently comfort themselves with the idea, well, you know, the white working class, they don't like us. They seem to be moving away from us. But, um, you know, these people are hopeless anyway. They're a bunch right. of crazy racists, you know, who can, who can talk to them anyway. But I think that the latest uh, political developments underscore the fact that for working class people of all races, including Hispanic, Asian, and black working class people, they're not on board with a lot of the ways the Democratic Party has evolved in its general set of cultural attitudes and they're, they're willing to entertain alternatives because you know they don't feel that compatible with a lot of these uh, elites who seem to dominate the Democratic Party. Here's my idea, yeah, yeah. Charlie, about mm -hmm. how they can solve that problem, mm -hmm. or at least it might help. Okay. The test I think Democrats should always be doing is what would the working class say? Can <laughs> they contemplate taking a position or releasing some statement or you know, bringing up some policy? Ask themselves, what would the working class say? WWWCS, right? Kind of like what would mm -hmm. Jesus do? What would the working class say? And I think if they did that, and they tried to answer that by thinking of whatever data they might have seen about this, or just, you know. They know some working class people. They have a sense of what these people think. Um, you know, maybe you shouldn't use the word birthing person. 
right? Because, you know, what would the working class say? They'd say that's fucking crazy, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I think if Democrats thought of their policy and their rhetoric more in terms of what would the working class say, right? I mean, just try to put yourself in the position of those kinds of voters and think about how they would actually react to what you're trying to do. Um, I think it would be helpful. I think it would cover a lot of, uh, you know, it'd sort of give you an interesting way of looking at a lot of the things that Democrats have done from the various transformational politics mistakes we've been talking about to the voting rights mistakes, to the rhetoric, uh, to, you know, the level of concentration on the issue of getting back to normal. What, what would the working class? You know, I, I'm about to overstate this, I think, but you know, as I'm listening to you say this, it seems like, of course, that's what they should do, but they're not doing it. And I wonder whether so many of the talking heads um, that we see that are really you know, creating the democratic image, whether many of these people actually know people in the working class, mm -hmm. whether they hang yeah. out with them, whether they go to the bars. Uh, and I think that's true in journalism as as well, because I remember as a young reporter, you know, when I was working for Metropolitan Daily with the Milwaukee Journal, they were still an older generation of reporters there. Um, many of them, some of them didn't have necessarily college educations, but they hung out in the same neighborhood as people that worked at, you know, at the factories, the Alice Chalmers, um, the, the cops, where they would go drinking. They were part of that world. They were comfortable. And I watched as they were sort of gradually replaced by people who, you know, no, didn't have those kinds of, of, of attachments. Because I think about this the way you do. I often think here in Wisconsin, if I was going to a George Webb's or I was going to um, one of the local, you know, watering holes here, what have I heard over the last 24 hours that would be persuasive to that crowd that might change their minds? And I struggle sometimes because mm -hmm. your average conversation on cable television isn't going to do, you know, you're right. You use the language that's going to be a trigger. You know, issues like crime and the border and trade and, you know, a variety of things that would land with them that you are not hearing Democrats talk about. This ought to be, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're feeling the same frustration. This ought to be obvious. And yet, it does seem as if that professional class that you've we've talked about a lot on this podcast already um, has a completely different agenda, and they live in a, in a completely different sort of cognitive world. I mean, they're not hanging out at the same places, are they? No, no, they're not. I mean, you 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 put it very well that uh, you know there is a difference between uh, today's journalists and yesterday's, between today's even people who staff advocacy groups and nonprofits and, and those of yesteryear. I mean, it, there clearly is a big cohort of younger, you know, highly educated people, a lot of them live on the coast, who, you know, may, they may not, in fact, know very many working class people, uh, and they never think about them. And, and here's what I think is, is at least something that potentially could be overcome is, yeah, okay, maybe you don't know a lot of working class people, uh, you didn't grow up with them. You don't hang out with them. You know, they're not in your hip bars you go to, whatever. But um, try to get out of that bubble and think about something else, right? I mean, look at some data. Look at focus group results. Look at um, talk to the taxi driver. I mean, just try to get a handle on what people who aren't like you think. Uh, and I think that is available to anyone, even if they have not grown up with these people, even if they don't go to the bars where working class people hang out, it's at least possible to do that. So, you know, at least we can try to popularize the idea. This is something that you should try to do. And yes, they're gonna be handicapped by the fact that they, 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 they live in a bit of a bubble, but that doesn't mean they can't look outside of that bubble or break out of that bubble in some ways. I mean, we, we swim in a sea of information. There's information out there about what actual working class people think. There's a lot of actual working class people to talk to. So uh, to me, this is something that shouldn't be optional for Democrats. It's it's mandatory. You know, I, um, But I think, yes, it's, it's going to be an uphill struggle convincing them to do it. Because the problem is when they hear about what working class people think, a lot of them have pre-existing categories to slot right. them into. I, I was, like I was saying I, X, that I, means they're racist, right? I mean, so case closed. But they've got to get outside of that. Way of thinking. Well, I was going to mention. I I, I know a guy who's uh, who's involved in politics in Wisconsin who really gets out and does go out into into the hinterlands, and he always had interesting observations. And I remember back in 2016 uh, having a conversation with him, and he was talking about a meeting in like northern Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin, uh, blue collar audience, 
And he said, he was describing the way two issues were playing out. Number one was free college education and or canceling student debt. The crowd Mm -hmm. hated it. They just, he said, he, he knew at that moment that Republicans were going to win because all the farmers were looking at each other and going, I didn't go to college. My kid's not necessarily going to college. I am not paying for somebody else to do it. The second was any reference to white privilege. Now, again, I understand all the the, the flags this is going to send up, but you say this to white working class people who have lost their jobs, who've seen the factories close down, and to hear their lives described as privileged. Wow, that didn't land. That was not playing either. And I'm I'm just not sure that some of the folks uh, who were using the the rhetoric or thinking that you know free college education was a winner, the working class is going to like that, right? Or you know let's talk about but more about white privilege. If they really understood about how that was driving some voters away, and that was just two examples, because I remember him saying how powerful that was, and why he thought um, the Republicans were going to win at a time when I don't think anybody thought Republicans were going to have a huge year back in 2016. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, both of those things are are highly questionable. I mean, people don't, and then this is again, what would the working class say? You've got to put yourself in the head of some of these people and say, well, okay, I mean, yeah, it sounds good to you because of the kind of person you are and where you live and you went to college, free college, great idea. But what do they think? I mean, maybe they think it's like basically a handout to people who aren't people like them, you know, they're not that, you know. It's, it doesn't mean the same thing to them that it does to you. So you at least need to think about that. The thing about white privilege is, is in many ways worse because it's, it's almost like the level of insanity involved in associating this term with a political party and its thinking is, is almost, it's like mind boggling, right? I mean, how can you like take a whole massive group of people and say they're privileged regardless of their economic status in life and the struggles they've had simply by virtue of their skin color, that they're white. This may go over well in the seminar room of Princeton or wherever, but it's toxic for most normie voters. They're not gonna buy it. They don't believe it. It just makes them mad. So, you know, the tolerance for this kind of rhetoric and these kinds of concepts within the Democratic Party at this point is, is, is really part of their problem. They should have had nothing to do with this kind of idea, but clearly it's had a big influence. Yeah, and they are totally invested in it. Rui Tushera, thank you so much for joining me. Um, the newsletter is The Liberal Patriot. I strongly recommend it on Substack, uh, as well as his books, The Emerging Democratic Majority. And are you still an optimistic leftist? Why the 21st century will be better than you think? Absolutely, but over the long term. (laughs) Yeah, it's feeling longer term all the time, isn't it? Rui, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I enjoyed it very much. It's a ton of fun, Charlie. Thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.